Very good morning to you all and um, welcome to the third and final day, which and um, this particular session is going to be on the potential stakeholder roles and incentives for participation. Um, I'd like to call on our first speaker, and that is Dr. Maria Elena Bottazzi, who is the Associate Professor and Vice Chair in the Department of Microbiology, Immunology and Tropical Medicine at the George uh, Washington University. Thank you, Dr. Bottazzi, please. Thank you. Hi, good morning everyone. Thank you so much for the invitation and the organizers, Dr. Purin. I have to apologize, Dr. Peter Hotes was not able to attend, so he sends me in representation. But after talking to him, uh, we've been trying to look to see how we could um, provide some insight of what could be potential stakeholder roles and incentives for participation, specifically for vaccine production for uh, flu. Um, so the, the way that we actually um, looked at this, is that um, there's certainly some clear incentives for participation, um, and, and certainly we can go over some of the roles that we think are important. And I'm going to start by showing you this slide, which actually I took from the Moran et al. recent paper that actually shows you that in the recent years, if you look at a landscape of where does funding for R&D and specifically for development of biologics, uh, primarily the total R&D funding that comes from uh, is divided into, let's say, three major uh, um, um, funders. Uh, governments, of course, with, of course, primary uh, uh, public uh, uh, big OECD uh, uh, governments, but also uh, innovative developing countries also have been um, uh, starting to provide funds for development of new biologics. Uh, certainly nonprofit organizations, um, we have the representation of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation amongst uh, them, where there's been a big influx of funding. Um, certainly private, uh, big pharma and small pharma. But I think what's important to see is that the way that they've been funneling the funds um, uh, is using very uh, specific mechanisms. Uh, which is uh, to go through what we call the product develop development public-private partnerships. And that's what I'm going to pretty much focus, uh, to use the, the model of PDPPPs as potential stakeholders and what will be the, the roles that we could play. Uh, and I'm going to, of course, focus primarily on the Human Hookworm Vaccine Initiative, which is one of these PDPPPs, and how we have built our capacity and how we now can leverage and certainly sustain it by providing um, our participation in other uh, uh, development of vaccines such as uh, flu vaccines. Uh, this is another slide from the Moran paper, and again, it's just to summarize that the, the public, private, and philanthropic, philanthropic sectors uh, uh, fund through PDPPPs, and this is just an example, and I'm not sure where I should be focusing the... I can't really point, but um, uh, you know, there's an array of uh, PDPPPs as well as uh, the tropical disease research, WHO, PAHO, etc. Um, but if we we'll go into more detail. I wanted to focus on those that are vaccine public-private partnerships. Uh, and you can see uh, some examples of some of the major uh, PDPPPs for vaccine development. And it's clear um, uh, that you know, in the recent year we have been seeing that there's clear value that come out of developing biologics, especially vaccines, using this, uh, this uh, um, model. Uh, primarily, uh, if you see it summarized in the slide, you know, we PDP PPPs tend to integrate and coordinate the different partners, whether it's industry, academic, public, contractors, you know, and, and they create these collaborations. I think this is very important. It, of course, uses business-like practices, which for some of us, for instance, that we're in the academic sector, it's it's novel and it's actually applying, you know, how, how private institutions apply business models and we look to see how we can do those um, when we work in academic environments. Um, we have certainly continued to apply basic science approaches, uh, and, and now we move more forward toward translational type of development of, of, by, by um, doing a more technology exchanges. Certainly, PDPPPs also provide a, a, a mode of portfolio management where, in fact, they can dictate where funds really go to based on where the, the, the program is at a certain point, whether it should go more 
to R&D or more to uh, process development, scale up, and, and, and then eventually clinical testing. Um, so they manage based primarily on relative merits of where is it that the funds should go, and of course they champion also the role, uh, they, 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 they provide our champion role in advocacy, and also um, provide uh, where the progress is, and certainly also identify gaps. So I'm going to now uh, try to focus on um, giving you as an example, uh, I'm going to use the Human Hookworm Vaccine Initiative partnerships. We are a comprehensive uh, 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 program which we primarily focus on developing recombinant type of vaccines. Of course, we focus on not only hookworm now, but you know an array of neglected tropical diseases, which I'll show you later. But we, we use a network of global partners. We certainly use a model of product development, tech transfer, and clinical development, and um, if we look at who are our partnerships, um, of course, I represent the George Washington University, which we do a lot of the product development activities, which I'll show you our capacity, but we work under a big umbrella of a sponsoring institution, which is really what holds our PDPPP, which is the Sabine Vaccine Institute. They provide regulatory sponsorship and also quality assurance, uh, and then we also collaborate with institutions such as Queensland Institute of Medical Research, London School, um, the Institute of Parasitic Diseases in China, and for our uh, clinical testing as well as for our um, manufacturing, we work in Brazil primarily, uh, both with the Ministry of Health uh, Research arm Fio Cruz as well as with Instituto Butantan. Um, the way that we have established our program is really trying to establish solid partnerships and enhance collaborations with other PDPPPs to eventually provide a clear impact on how to develop recombinant protein vaccines. And of course, because we're trying to develop vaccines for the poor primarily, we certainly have tried to apply low-cost approaches, and we use a model for de uh, a vaccine development that we call fast transition to phase one, which is the first in human model. But to summarize, and I'll I'll go into more detail in the next couple of slides. We have attempted to do it in different stages. So we first had to, of course, build the expertise, build the technology, build the lab and field infrastructure. Um, then we, we expanded it and tried to leverage it now. Um, and of course, eventually, we need to sustain it to, you know, to try to diversify our portfolio, both financially and also uh, uh, by objectives, and certainly start thinking what, uh, how it will uh, uh, impact globally and through a global access plan. So to summarize again, we, the, the, the HHVI have decided to primarily apply the first in human model for vaccine development. Um, the premise is that what we look is to accelerate candidate advancement, to go very quickly into phase one clinical trials. We do that by really putting a, a slightly smaller upfront investments uh, for the actual product development and process development, and we focus to very rapidly go into safety testing to try to then down select those that are you know safe versus is non-safe. Certainly we understand that it's a high-risk uh, approach uh, and that eventually those who pass the first stage will have to uh, involve longer development timelines to go back and develop uh, better processes for uh, development of the vaccine for phase two and phase three. But it has worked well for us. Um, we've already had uh, uh, one molecule that has been accelerated and we're almost ready to uh, transition a second molecule um, into phase one. Now, even though we use that model, we certainly do not go different from any other uh, vaccine development program. We, we use targeted product development. We still use the same concepts. We have a target product profiles. We create product development strategies. And those that are closing the boxes is really what we focus on at the George Washington University. We, of course, uh, have uh, done already all that discovery, but we focus on feasibility, small-scale expression, formulation, uh, uh, some quality control, and then ideally the tech transfer into the manufacturing and, and then uh, provide clinical development. 
So very briefly to go over some of the capabilities that we have established at GW, um, we're very proud of the fact that we have uh, set up uh, a set of technical units that dedicate specifically for advancing the uh, uh, product development, starting from molecular biology units that uh, focus on early feasibility expression uh, of, of our different molecules. Primarily we use uh, both bacterial as well as yeast expression systems. Um, then of course we transition into scale up mid-scale. We have capacity up to the 10 liter scale uh, uh, fermentation as well as purification. Purification we actually have the capacity of doing up to 60 liter scale purification processes. Uh, of course formulation unit and then we have a very strong quality control which includes animal development uh, a unit, animal testing and a preclinical and clinical immunology unit. After we have set up uh, uh, the processes up to the 10 liter scale, we certainly have worked with uh, several organizations, including Butantan in Brazil, the Ares TB Foundation, and Walter Reed, to uh, tech transfer and scale up for manufacturing up to the 60 liter. Uh, uh, with Brazil, we primarily have helped also uh, them suit up a pilot plant that they have for up to 60 liter scale. Um, so we've been very successful with that at that front. And then more specifically for the clinical development, uh, it's been a very interesting collaboration with the Ministry of Health and Field Cruz in Brazil. We work primarily in the state of Minas Gerais. Certainly we picked that uh, region because of the endemicity of the diseases that we work uh, on. Uh, and we along with them have uh, developed a clinical uh, field-based clinical uh, unit where we um, prepare and design clinical protocols. We of course go through the regulatory experience both uh, in the U.S. as well as in Brazil. We have built a clinic with them. Uh, we have prepared the community and we um, pretty much have the capacity of doing first in human um, trials there. So Everything that I've said, uh, uh, it's been certainly uh, um, uh, a, an endeavor that we've been doing for the last uh, nine years. Uh, you see where we are right now. Um, so to summarize, in the first years, um, and certainly through uh, a solid funding that we've been receiving in, through the Saving Vaccine Institute and, in, and organizations such as the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, we had been able to, to really uh, uh, create strategic and strong partnerships. Uh, we certainly have developed uh, in-house technical expertise uh, for fermentation, purification, and formulation technology, as well as quality assurance and quality control systems. We have established good training programs, uh, field site selection and preparation. We have clinical laboratories, uh, and certainly we also have good program uh, and regulatory management. Um, we now are in more of what we call the leverage um, and, and, and expansion mode where we are continue to strengthen our expertise uh, and we certainly work based on milestones and knowledge and we, we certainly always do knowledge dissemination through publications and right now we're, we're entering a phase where we certainly are looking to be potential new stakeholders for example uh, to diversify our portfolio to provide to others uh, that are also developing biologics um, our capacity. Uh, currently we we have programs to develop certainly hookworm vaccine, the schistosomiasis vaccine. We have a small program to advance a molecule uh, for S. Mansoni. We just got an NIH grant um, in collaboration with New York Blood Center to uh, down select and pick some uh, potential Oncocerca vaccine candidates. We recently received a feasibility of expression pr uh, project from Path MVI to uh, develop a um, malaria transmission blocking vaccine, and we're working with some small uh, pharma to um, attempt to leverage in the, and use our clinical trial sites. Uh, and certainly we, we're trying to diversify our funding. So in summary, uh, major milestones that you know could certainly be applied to other uh, um, PDPPPs is to establish uh, uh, vaccine R&D and process development. We have done it in-house at GW. Uh, we certainly have established processes of how to do successful technology transfer, working with uh, some of the developing country ma vaccine manufacturers, such as Butantan, as well as uh, here in the US. We have established the good infrastructure 
for a clinical testing and certainly we go through the same processes for regulatory. Uh, we recently are trying to expand uh, also into adjuvant uh, evaluation programs. We recently acquired a license for using CPG for um, uh, NTD vaccines and we certainly continue to um, publish and disseminate our findings. And I think that's all I have uh, to share with you and I'm looking forward to more discussions. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Dr. Batanzi. I'd like to then call on Dr. Norbert Hemmer, and he is the chair of the IFPMA, Influenza Vaccine Supply International Task Force. Dr. Hemmer. Thanks very much. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I would first like to thank the organizers for inviting IFPMA to provide some considerations from the industry side about plans for local production of flu vaccines. IFPMA stands for the International Federation of Pharmaceutical Manufacturers and Associations being headquartered in Geneva. And uh, these influenza vaccine supply international task force is representing one of the dedicated working groups under the roof of IFPMA. It has been established a couple of years ago and is representing now 16 research-based vaccine companies which are engaged in the development and manufacture of both seasonal as well as pandemic vaccines. Uh, currently, I'm the chair of the IVS task force and uh, our work is structured into two working groups. One working group is dealing with science production and regulatory issues and is chaired by Tony Colgate, who is also attending that workshop and might uh, support me during the upcoming discussion later on. A second working group is dedicated to practices, policies and communication aspects with regard to flu vaccination. If we talk about the production of influenza vaccines in developing countries, we need to understand first uh, some specific elements uh, because there is no doubt that uh, many vaccines are manufactured in large volumes and will be used around the world, including in developing countries, but this is not widely the case for flu vaccines due to the low demand for seasonal vaccines in many of these countries. and the very few chances uh, to predict in advance uh, the period, the occurrence of a concrete pandemic event. That's why the establishment of local influenza vaccine manufacturing capacities, uh, which has been proposed as a possible solution to increase global supply capacities for uh, vaccines, uh, requires to understand the intrinsic links uh, between the demand and supply of influenza vaccines uh, because without having a clear demand for seasonal vaccines in place, we are not seriously in a position uh, to develop a model which would uh, guarantee a long-term sustainable approach in that field. And there are, generally speaking, of course, a couple of challenges and limitations behind which require to follow stepwise, short, medium, and long-term approaches. If we uh, try to investigate a couple of factors affecting uh, the access uh, to vaccines, there is, of course, a need to have a basic infrastructure in place, and that applies in particular to cold chain requirements. We should also be able to rely on long-term forecasting uh, models. We have to deal with financial and logistical hurdles. The capacity building is for sure uh, the main element 
in these kind of programs, but we have also widely discussed and uh, very much in detail, and I was especially pleased about that part of the program yesterday, the regulatory dimension behind. And last but not least, we need to rely on the political willingness of uh, all stakeholders, and that's raising the question at the end, what could be the role of technology transfer in addressing uh, these matters. We are used to talk uh, preferably about the needs in view of uh, pandemic threats. But there are a couple of elements which apply the same way to seasonal flu vaccines. Uh, because what manufacturers have to do in collaboration with involved stakeholders is to adapt the vaccines frequently to the changes in the global epidemiology. It's a seasonal product and uh, we have needs to replace strains, sometimes just one strain, uh, sometimes even two strains year by year. We are facing a very limited production period uh, of just uh, between six and seven months in order to make the vaccine available in due time to the different marketplaces. If we are not able to do so from a pharmaceutical industry's point of view, we would just accumulate uh, waste of material because the vaccine cannot be stockpiled uh, for later use and would need to be destroyed finally creating the financial consequences. We have heard a lot uh, in these two days about the development of novel vaccines and technologies, uh, but we should clearly take into account that for the time being most of the influenza vaccines which are produced globally are still egg-based vaccines. And the final element, uh, it's also uh, quite important uh, to understand that the technology is specific for each inactivated and life attenuated vaccine. There are a lot of similarities in terms of upstream processes, but we see plenty of specifics in the design of technologies for downstream processes. That's just summarizing the annual cycle uh, for seasonal vaccine uh, manufacturing, and I'm coming back to the point I made already about the time limitations we are facing, uh, because a prerequisite is, of course, to know in advance what we have to produce. And so far, the WHO strain uh, recommendation process is representing one of the key elements with regard to flu vaccine manufacturing. We have two meetings uh, per year, a meeting by mid-February uh, to issue a strain recommendation for the upcoming winter season in the Northern Hemisphere, and we are doing the same in favor of the Southern Hemisphere situation in the second half of September. Assuming that usually at least one strain need to be replaced, it will take some time to make first seed virus materials available. Typically, we are not getting uh, access to these uh, seed virus candidates before April. And as discussed yesterday already, a second very important element is the timely availability of strain-specific reagents in order to determine the potency of bulk material produced and finally uh, the formulated vaccine. These technical interdependencies are complemented by a couple of regulatory needs and the elements I have here highlighted uh, refer in particular to the European regulatory situation because the existing basic files need to be updated year by year in terms of providing a technical file update, a, a strain file update, and not to forget there is a need to run annually licensing trials uh, in Europe, and that's why at the end a clinical file is completing uh, these efforts.
considering uh, technology transfer uh, ideas and principles, there are a wide range of health-related technologies which can be transferred and that was uh, discussed also uh, yesterday already uh, because we have to take into perspective that we are not just talking about establishing manufacturing capacities, we have to think about the R&D needs behind the training of personnel clinical development uh, programs, uh, lab test, establishing lab testing capacities, having the appropriate uh, quality management uh, systems uh, in place, being able to manage supply chain needs and handling the logistical specifics. Uh, we uh, need to rely on the support provided by IT systems. There are project and HR management uh, requirements uh, we are facing, and last but not least, the main elements of production. In so far, the local production, meaning to think about specifically about manufacturing efforts and building the capacities for it, is just one type of the technology transfer requirements. A similar uh, picture has been presented uh, yesterday already. It's just to illustrate uh, the collaborating efforts in producing flu vaccines and it uh, applies uh, the same way uh, finally for seasonal as well as for pandemic vaccines because it's not an exclusive scope of activities which is under the control of the vaccine industry only because we can only do our job in a very strong and effective collaboration with other stakeholders like WHO, WHO collaborating centers, essential regulatory labs and regulatory agencies. And it keeps included uh, uh, specific elements, uh, the selection of appropriate uh, virus samples in order to prepare seed virus candidates, the evaluation of seed virus materials, the timely production, uh, production of uh, reagents, and finally the release of produced vaccine. In addition to that, uh, Actual collaboration we have in place, uh, we put also some uh, efforts behind in order to uh, fund these activities financially. And we have signed with uh, the New York Medical uh, College and uh, with uh, one of the WHO essential regulatory labs, meaning the NIPSC, so called ACT for the development of high grocery assortants and we are also supporting financially the extended isolation of seasonal influenza viruses uh, in X and that means to support the activities at CDC in Atlanta, uh, the WHO collaborating center in Melbourne and at the Institute of, uh, National Institute of Medical Research in London and uh, the total financial support amounts to approximately 2 million annually. There are also a couple of uh, generic elements uh, if we think about uh, the technology transfer for vaccines and biologics because uh, these approaches, in case of biologicals, present a high level of technical difficulty and know how behind. And we still believe that uh, basically a tech transfer approach should uh, be based on mature technologies and licensed products preferably. Even for an experienced vaccine manufacturer, uh, the transfer of production activities just to another building or a different site is representing a real challenge and quality control aspects and quality compliance uh, requirements uh, in order to comply with regulations which are in place at national and international level are by far the greatest uh, challenge in manufacturing of vaccines. 
that's just to give you a flavor about the timelines behind these kind of uh, investment projects because if we take into consideration all key elements starting uh, with the preparational steps by defining user requirements, uh, developing the different design phases, uh, then moving into the concrete construction activities and ending up finally with the qualification and validation needs. We are talking in total about a time frame between four and five years. Nevertheless, IFPMA members are willing to discuss various approaches uh, in favor of an extended local production in developing countries, including secondary manufacturing approaches. Uh, but uh, we suggest uh, to consider uh, these kind of projects on a case-by-case -case approach following a stepwise uh, effort and in the framework of a long-term cooperation and partnership in order to make sure that adequate and effective application of intellectual property uh, rules can support the continued development of vaccines. At the end, successful partnerships would result from a strong economic and strategic value for both parties. We need to create a win-win situation. An appropriate level of expertise at the uh, local level uh, seems to be mandatory as outlined yesterday also and we have uh, to define in early stages a set of realistic and achievable objectives. The ability to achieve consistent uh, quality conditions in order to meet the quality standards which are in place is also representing one of the major elements and having a national, a competent national uh, control authorities is uh, with no doubt mandatory in order to be successful in overseeing uh, the regulatory and uh, quality requirements. Last but not least, local production specifically of influenza vaccines must be coupled with an implementation of seasonal influenza vaccination programs. Uh, taking into perspective the interdependencies between uh, seasonal and pandemic flu vaccine manufacturing in order to keep these manufacturing efforts in particular for pandemic scenarios sustainable in the long run. At the end, I would just like to present an overview uh, about a couple of uh, concrete uh, transfer projects which have been put in place already. Uh, Nobelon has granted to WHO for egg-based seasonal and pandemic life attenuated vaccines uh, technology allowing WHO to sub-license that technology uh, to public sector vaccine producers in developing countries and Thailand has been the first country uh, which requested uh, such a kind of sub-license. Just last year, Sanofi Pasteur signed an agreement with Birmex in Mexico to build a facility for the manufacture of seasonal and pandemic vaccines. GSK Biologicals joined, uh, uh, went into a joint venture agreement with Jensen Neptunus in China with the same target uh, on the for the development and manufacture of both seasonal as well as pandemic vaccines. A similar agreement in China was signed one year before between Sanofi, uh, Pasteur and the local producer. Uh, Beacon from Japan uh, has signed an agreement with Biopharma in Indonesia for building a facility to manufacture seasonal vaccines. And we had a very first uh, huge project also initiated by Sanofi Pasteur in collaboration with Budan Tran in Sao Paulo uh, for the manufacturing of seasonal vaccine, which allows also to use these facilities now in a pandemic scenario. Thanks very much. Thanks, Dr. Hema.
I'd like to thank uh, both our speakers for the comprehensive um, outlines, and I'd really like to now open the um, discussion to the floor, and if you have any specific questions and, and discussion points, uh, please could you raise them. Mary Paul. And please Thank just identify yourself so that everybody knows who, who you are. Marie Paul Kini, WHO. Thanks, no, but uh, I think that we, we agree certainly on, on, on most of the points that you have made about the stepwise approach, about you know the need for a seasonal vaccine market. Just two, two points I'd like to make is that if um, if the idea of the notion be behind setting up a local production of influenza vaccine is for pandemic preparedness, I would like to bring attention to the fact that going only for secondary manufacturing is may maybe um, not will not work because for example there is um, not in developing country but there are secondary manufacturers of influenza vaccines in Europe also and during the pandemic they could not produce any pandemic because they have been incapable of securing access to bulk so um, so this approach would work with seasonal but is unlikely to work in terms of pandemic preparedness um, the other point I uh, just wanted to make is that indeed all these, these projects in technology transfer should take into consideration the respect of intellectual property rights uh, provision in the various countries. But we are, uh, in, for most of the technology for making influenza vaccines, there are currently no IP barriers. So this is a, ba uh, this is a hurdle which is uh, very current for certain new vaccines, but very much less, less so for for, um, uh, for influenza vaccines. Thanks. I think it's, it, it works. Um, uh, uh, it, it's on. It's on. Uh, thanks for your comments, uh, Mary Poole. Uh, I entirely agree with the points you made. Because in the long run, it's definitely needed not just to think about uh, how we could establish secondary activities uh, at local level, uh, but uh, usually, and that leads back to the point I made about following stepwise approaches, it might uh, accelerate the process and to get a more reliable approach, having these kind of activities established first and then moving into next phases in a prudent approach. And for these examples I have summarized in, uh, on the last slide, it's basically the case uh, uh, for each single project. Uh, because what we are going to do in our joint venture from GSK Bios side in China is exactly uh, to take into perspective both elements, secondary manufacturing as a point uh, to get the project started, but at the end to end up really in a collaborative effort for both the development and bulk manufacturing of seasonal and pandemic vaccines. And things are running in a similar way for all these other projects uh, which uh, have been summarized. As far as the intellectual property uh, aspects are concerned, basically you are right. Uh, there's not so much uh, uh, IP dimension behind these uh, technologies which are firmly established for a while already. But it can look different already if we take into perspective uh, vaccines which have been developed more recently. And I'm talking, for example, about adjuvanted vaccines, uh, because these novel adjuvants are patent protected. Yes, sir. Uh, Daniel Miller from HHS. Uh, um, this is actually a question, uh, I don't know whether it's a comment or a question, but you can interpret it however you would like. For, for both um, uh, speakers, we talked yesterday about um, the need for successful business models that could enable um, the uh, increase of manufacturing capacity in um, uh, developing countries. and. Um, I'm just wondering whether uh, either speaker can, uh, certainly from the academic side in terms of the know-how transfer and the partnering, uh, one first part of the question is, what are the critical uh, enablers that 
can, that predict a successful partnership with either academic institutions or companies uh, or other partners in developing countries um, that, that we can learn about? And are there particular business models um, that, not wanting to get into proprietary information, but are there particular business models that have been more successful um, in promoting these kinds of partnerships um, that we could be looking to in terms of, of um, lessons learned um, and uh, applying to other situations? I'll start, um, and I can share with you um, some of the experiences that we've had. Um, certainly, as far as what what has been um, critical for us to be successful when we, as an academic institution, enter into the collaborations, is certainly transparency. Uh, which means that you have to have the ability of really showing all the information and all the data with whoever you want to partner and reciprocal that they should be able to also uh, be able to really show what their capacity as well as what their information is. The way that we have approached, and I can use the example with uh, Instituto Butantan for instance, is that we um, set up teleconferences and site visits. At least um, we go and see them um, once or twice a year and they come up and visit us at least once or twice a year. And that allows us to really see how their processes are and as well as what are the, the needs that we have when we attempt to then technology transfer and have them manufacture what, what, what we need for, for our vaccines. As far as the business model that we've been using, it's just, uh, it's really a combination, I have to say. Being an academic environment, we work a lot under material transfer agreements as well as research agreements. But, uh, but I think also just to have, a, 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 even as a simple as a memorandum of understanding where it clearly states what are the responsibilities and the, and the expectations of each of us. Like if we're going to enter into a solid collaboration, as simple as who, who should be doing what and who and what resources each would uh, be willing to um, provide, whether it's a financial resource or just a personnel or even technology capacity. Uh, uh, um, uh, that's what we basically have been using. And so I think that primarily if, you know, whatever we have learned is that you definitely be engaged and, and, f and physically work together and not necessarily just give it as a, as a contract and here's the recipe and, and do it as we say and that's all and that's it. We actually sit with them and go over the processes step by step because there's things that we use in our labs here that they certainly don't apply. I mean, I can give you even as a simple as an example as what type of gels we use to run our, our SDS agarose gels. They, they have different types of systems that they use down there and we have to both adapt to those systems. Uh, I have not so much to add because it looks basically the same way from an, or with regard to the industry's experience uh, because it's a matter of fact that the Big pharmaceutical manufacturers in particular uh, are rely on a widespread collaboration with regard to development projects with many uh, uh, stakeholders in biotech and in academia. Uh, there's maybe just one additional element, in particular with regard to such uh, tech transfer projects for supporting an uh, expanded manufacturing uh, capacity at global scale. Uh, we have to take into perspective, of course, a couple of commercial elements, uh, market access uh, reflections, and uh, this uh, is typically creating a win-win situation for both sides because there is no doubt that in a couple of markets and areas there are restrictive uh, regulations in place, uh, blocking or even uh, making uh, it for companies quite difficult to get easily market access in, and that's why collaborating uh, with a local company, with a local partner is uh, an 
appropriate way to overcome these type of hurdles and creating a beneficial situation, last but not least from a commercial point of view for both sides. Yes, sir. Hi, Doug Holtzman from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. I just wanted to, again, congratulate the speakers. I thought, Norbert, your, your presentation was excellent. And, and I think we, we kind of need to distinguish between business processes and business models. I mean, I think, you know, everything that you said um, uh, was, was really focused on the, the, the mechanisms of collaboration and interacting. And I think the business model um, is, is a little bit more towards the early, you know, yesterday's question of sustainability and how, how, are, how are you going to yeah. engage. And I, I thought your you know, I, I agree that in, when we think about short, medium, and long-term approaches, that your concept of sort of starting with sort of fill finish and finding partners and using that to drive, um, as you said, engagement in a seasonal flu uh, uh, distribution programs within countries, I mean, that, that seems to me to be a very sensible first step to try and find the committed partners, even as countries grapple with the, um, the, 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 the less um, concrete concerns about, you know, when will the next pandemic be, so. Yes, ma'am. Uh, this is a question for Dr. Him. Uh, uh, I would like to discuss a little bit about the real benefits of transfer technology in case of secondary manufacturing, the benefits for the receptor countries in case of pandemic, because we know that the manufacturer will have the main, as main priority to supply the demand of their own country. And we know that in, as in this case happened, the manufacturer, uh, the receptor country of secondary transfer technology will receive the benefit of, of the product until the, their own country and the manufacturer's country will have, uh, have uh, the supply completely and satisfy their own demands. I think that secondary manufacturers will benefit the country only if we has uh, behind uh, the intention to have the complete transfer technology to the receptor uh, thanks for your comment. I think it leads back uh, to the points Mary Polkini made already. Uh, I basically uh, agree uh, with these kind of uh, considerations, uh, but as I tried to explain before, Starting with secondary activities might represent an appropriate step uh, to get such a collaboration started uh, in a short term. Uh, but you are right, in the long run, it should keep included the full scope of manufacturing activities because otherwise we are missing a lot of efficiency potential, in particular in case of a pandemic threat. Because all these transportation needs behind, in case of a more serious pandemic, are not representing an easy task, uh, because we could easily experience a more sophisticated situation next time in terms of closing borders and things like that. Having a huge burden in uh, transportation and logistical systems at all which might uh, create a lot of very sophisticated problems in order to keep such a collaboration alive if we have still to rely on a transfer of huge volumes of bulk materials into a res uh, receptor country. Uh, David Wood, WHO. Question to, to Norbert. You very nicely highlighted that in tech transfer projects, it's not just the actual you know, production know-how. There's a whole range of other elements that need to be transferred. Mm -hmm. So in the experience that is being gained within the pharmaceutical industry and these tech transfers, are there any particular elements you know, that are more difficult or more complicated to do than others? Do we need to be paying particular attention, uh, you know, in the tech transfer process to some of the, you know, particular elements? Um. Mm -hmm. uh, David, I'm afraid it's uh, quite difficult uh, to provide a generic answer uh, on that question because it uh, will look most probably quite different uh, project by project. Uh, because one of the major aspects behind is really the level of expertise and know-how you can uh, rely on in getting started these kind of projects. 
and uh, based on the experience we have uh, very uh, sophisticated or a couple of very sophisticated elements which uh, represent intrinsic hurdles or in the regulatory field or in the field of having the appropriate level of expertise with regard to quality management requirements, training of people and stuff like that. Because it's purely daydreaming if somebody would believe you can get started these kind of projects with totally unexperienced people. And that's why I can just echo the comment Mary Bull provided yesterday is that WHO is requesting for all these tech transfer uh, projects that it's not exclusively relying on a project for flu vaccine manufacturing. There should be some expertise in place having at least one additional vaccine production established already. Um, thank you. Uh, my name is Kansuke Nagaoka from Japanese Foreign Ministry. I have a comment to the uh, Dr. Hem's uh, presentation. From our own experiences uh, in the business relation between Japanese companies and their partners in some Asian countries, we also agree that the uh, incremental step-by-step -step and case-by-case -case approach uh, seems to be appropriate in technology transfer. And uh, we actually have done the uh, kind of combination between incremental approach and also private-public partnership. I mean, uh, at the very beginning of the uh, say pilot phase, say, the Japanese government had sent the experts on their own budget as part of its official development assistance project to those companies in uh, some, uh, uh, some Asian countries. And these experts are actually retired or incumbent uh, experts working in the Japanese pharmaceutical companies. And once the uh, you know, say mutual trust uh, is developed through the pilot phase, and then the uh, purely private-private partnership will be developed. And after that, say they would say go on if they like with each other to expand the uh, technology transfer or other kind of business cooperation. So that's what we have been doing. Thank you. Uh, I fully agree with the points you made, and I think it's representing a very generic uh, experience among uh, industry partners, uh, because what you have tried to highlight is representing a very crucial element, uh, because we need to be able, relying on an efficient uh, interaction uh, between humans, and that requires uh, to initiate in very early stages already the exchange of people, bringing in uh, people from the partner company uh, to get first insights into the established operations, uh, uh, let's say, at uh, level in certain countries of these uh, uh, companies who would act as a donor company. Finally, it requires the same way to bring in people from the donor company in early stages uh, to the uh, receiving uh, country in order to get started in very effective collaboration between the people who have to manage these kind of projects and creating in very early stages a reliable understanding about the uh, challenges both partners are going to face, uh, the foundations which are in place already or need to be developed in a uh, short uh, to midterm. Uh, and so forth, thanks for uh, your comment. It's uh, also, in our view, uh, representing a very important element. Dr. Patasi, do you have any comments? Current, just looking at the discussion that are, are taking place. Yes, and I think it really, um, the bottom line is what you were mentioning is primarily is commitment that you mm -hmm. want to keep uh, from the partners. You know, so if you go and do technology transfer, or if you transfer some expertise, you know, whoever is accepting, you know, that expertise, it, it provides additional commitment that then will lead into potential sustainability of the program because it's not fair just to go in, do a project, and then go out and no, not leave anything or leave any capacity, but not only leaving that capacity, but it's ensuring that um, there's going to be commitment to uh, internally continuing the project. So I think it's it all comes down to commitment on both sides. 
Yeah, and maybe it, uh, just one uh, additional aspect. Uh, it's an intrinsic element of these kind of projects. In particular, if you have uh, reached a phase where concrete activities are going to start already, so that you will establish uh, mixed teams, mm -hmm. uh, keeping involved partners from both sides. Because that's the only way uh, that these kind of projects will fly at the end. And you have to define also in early stages uh, some timelines which need to be respected, meaning how long uh, delegated people need to stay uh, in such a partnering company. And so far, cutting a long story short, it's requiring a very collaborative effort uh, of people working together on the same goal and uh, objectives. I, I was thinking of uh, something additional, which is referring still to the fact of how do you then establish the sustainability. And I think at some point we, we, uh, it was touched on the political willingness also. And for instance, I think one of the challenges that we're going to face eventually is, for instance, when we're working in Brazil, is that we, we can do very short-term projects, uh, let's say, to the pilot level. Uh, but when we're starting to think of what's going to happen when we actually have to look for an Instituto Butantan to go into phase threes or eventually licensure, and the limitations that they may have because they're, they're still linked to the fact that they need political willingness because the funding that they get it's not their, their own, it's the government's funding. So ideally, it's not only to work with the partner uh, uh, in a short term, but also engage whoever the political influences that will, will ensure that there will be sustainability and that there's not going to be any issues in the, in, the, in the long term to have them continue the projects into getting products into licensure. At least that's our case. I, you know, maybe for fluids more advanced, but in our case, we're starting with very small scale productions, but eventually somebody has to make the, the hookworm vaccine that we will eventually have to license. Or, and, and, and I think right now we need to ensure that Butantan, if it's the partner that will be doing vaccines for, let's say, Latin America, who will be supporting that, that political willingness of having them take charge of those kinds of activities. So you know, it has to be looked at more outside of the box and more long term. Yeah, Joe Brzee from CDC. That 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 sort of segues into my exact question for you, Dr. Potosi, is, is that uh, Dr. Hay mentioned that that uh, one of the obstacles for for getting more people interested in flu vaccines is is the appreciation of the need for the vaccine, the demand for the vaccine. In effect, in the hookworm project, you mentioned a, a very robust, interesting program of making a vaccine and and developing it and testing it. Uh, you didn't mention as much about the activities surrounding creating the uh, creating and communicating maybe the appreciation of the need for the vaccine is that part of your program do you have activities in surveillance disease burden estimation communication that, that, that yes, you might that, talk about that's correct and I think you know I alluded that we do have a, a, a program where we also focus on what we call a global access plan and that involves certainly understanding the burden of the diseases um, that we work on especially hookworm and where um, advocate where we actually do those studies, like for instance in Brazil, the, the way that we originally started with our field sites is it was primarily to establish um, seroepidemiological studies, and then that led into determining which of those sites would be selected for potential eventually use uh, in clinical testing sites. Um, so we have been involved. Um, of course, Peter is is big into neglected tropical disease advocacy. All also in policy to try to um, make these diseases more into the awareness of not only uh, scientists and but you know even the the, the, the political. Um, um. So we have been working very strongly with the governments in Brazil or even other governments to make sure that they understand that there will be a need and that you know these diseases you know in these types of control programs will certainly complement other control programs. So you know for instance. Uh, 
uh, we believe that it, it, it has to be very much in sync also with uh, um, the current drug uh, uh, chemotherapy and deworming program. So it has to go hand in hand with even other things like you know world food programs or child immunization days. You know, there's a lot of things that we of course need to consider because it's a vaccine that may not be as clearly perceived that it, it will be needed. This is Maria Cortez again from Pajo. Just to complement the, the, the comment that you make, uh, Brazil is one of the countries where well, is the most important manufacturer at the moment in the, in the region. And they, in fact, they already have a plan for influenza vaccine. This is a big plan for capability of 60 million of doses per year. And, and they have been, uh, they have already the plant and they have already all the equipment installed. And, but uh, they have so many other projects and I think that this is the problem now. They have to define exactly what are going to be the priorities for the country. But if it's one country and one manufacturer uh, has uh, uh, probabilities to have a lot of success is, is, is Butantan. May I just comment that we're also certainly working with Biomanguinos at the same time because, like you said, you know they they have very many many different projects at all levels. Of course, we are at very early stages. Then you have programs such as you know the influenza program, but we certainly are going to be competing with much more maybe important programs than maybe Hukwam is perceived currently. So we really need to try to advocate and look for alternatives even in, internally in Brazil. So it's going to be important. I'm Abdullah Brooks from uh, ICDRB Johns Hopkins. I, I'm hearing something that, um, first of all, thank both of you for, I think, brilliant presentations. It certainly has been an eye-opener for me. What I'm hearing, however, is something I think is somewhat of a conundrum. Um, and so let me see if I can pose a, a, a very direct question, perhaps a bit uncomfortably. If you have two companies, one in a middle-income country, another in a low-income country, uh, both have the same longevity, both have been around for, let's say, 15 years, both have more than one uh, product line, so they're not exclusively dependent on the development of seasonal influenza. Um, and one exists in a climate, uh, both have business plans, both have done face-to-face -face meetings, have demonstrated commitment. One exists in a climate of political stability, another, the low-income country, in, in a politically uncertain environment, to say the least. Hmm. Which one, and you can only make a choice of one or the other, which one are you likely to choose? <laughs> and if, if you say you're going to choose the middle-income country, then my question to you is, is the standard business model sufficiently robust to overcome the inherent environmental inertia that holds many of these countries back? Because these are the kinds of countries in which we're trying to increase capacity as well as demand. And so I, I wonder if this is really an appropriate model to address that, uh, that challenge that faces this particular conference. <laughs> so it sounds like jeopardy. <laughs> uh, I think you have highlighted a um, very important aspect, uh, but I'm afraid it's uh, not easy to give uh, a single uh, answer which uh, would really cover these kind of aspects, because one thing is for sure, this type of uh, political stability aspects uh, are representing a key element in the uh, selection process for these kind of partnerships and you cannot ignore uh, these uncertainties which would be behind if you try to create a sustainable project in particular in the long run. On the other side I think uh, uh, it would not be appropriate uh, to say it's black or white, but it's for sure representing one of the key aspects in evaluating potential partnering approaches. I may have a, a slightly maybe 
different answer. And I think, of course, in the context of what we are trying to also attempt, because when we look also for the hookworm uh, vaccine program, even though we are strongly focusing on Brazil right now, we of course have to look for what's going to happen down the road when we actually have to address the needs in the rest of the world. So we actually could see the scenario maybe this way, where the Brazilians actually, if we, if we decide to do select the IDC country manufacturer or uh, developer, um, maybe they can also take a lead into transitioning and tech transferring and capacity building with low income or other countries that need more capacity building. And a typical example is, I know Brazil is very much interested now into doing South-South collaborations with Africa, especially with Portuguese speaking uh, African countries. So it could arguably be that you could see a scenario where you can start with an IDC and then the IDC with the, the developed country, the IDC then it takes the lead into going into the more unstable or the more less uh, uh, built um, countries or, or, or manufacturers. So maybe that could be an approach that could be considered. Uh, Daniel Miller again with a multi-stage question as usual. Um, in, in terms of the um, I can't see where it is. business plans are uh, and business models are frequently uh, related not only to um, market um, <clears throat> uh, and pricing and uh, uh, market share, but also related to intellectual property. And that is, uh, I don't want to have us diverted off into an intellectual property discussion. Many of you are aware of, of ongoing controversies and, and um, uh, quagmires that we find ourselves in related to influenza and intellectual property. But uh, a, a relatively recent uh, new model as you even indicated on your slide, is the Nobelon model. Um, do you have any sense um, uh, in terms of granting sub-licenses um, to international organizations such as WHO? Do you have any sense in within your own uh, federation as to, uh, uh, and once again, I don't want to get into proprietary or, 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 or discussions that, that you're uncomfortable with in a public arena, but is that a model that is um, uh, generating any interest, or um, is there are, uh, what might be the nature of some of the concerns that, uh, or has this even come up uh, in federation discussions um, uh, in terms of, of, of that approach? I think it's premature uh, trying to give you an answer uh, because uh, starting in 2006 or 2007, if my recollection is right, we moved into a so-called intergovernmental process and it was initiated uh, at that point in time by Indonesia requiring to get a compensation for providing uh, virus uh, samples uh, of uh, CH5N1 subtype. And that scope of activities has proven significantly over time and the process is still not uh, completed. In so far, uh, the points you have raised uh, represent intrinsic elements of discussion with regard to that uh, intergovernmental process. And your question about the appropriateness uh, of a deal uh, which was offered by Norbelon uh, to WHO, if this could represent a kind of standard approach uh, for vaccine industry at all. Uh, I cannot say yes or no, because that needs to be uh, uh, investigated and decided uh, company by company. And an industry association like IFPMA is not a, uh, in a position uh, to take a generic decision on these kind of activities and projects. Uh, I think I was trying to take a stepwise approach in my question uh, in terms of um, 
has it generated? Uh, uh, I know that uh, have been being intimately uh, engaged in those uh, three years of negotiations, uh, well aware of the sensitivities on on taking a uh, having opinion on one model or another. Mm -hmm. But I was just wondering if if this is an active uh, agenda item. Uh, of discussion among uh, uh, within the federation um, as a stepwise in terms of of um, uh, un understanding uh, uh, what options might be. Yes, I try to explain uh, these kind of considerations uh, belong to a bigger scope of uh, sorts. Uh, uh, because we have to deal uh, first uh, with the ideas, with the requirements uh, we have faced uh, in that intergovernmental process uh, coming from countries, uh, coming uh, from uh, the public sector. On the other side, uh, we have still not completed uh, the process of how to react in a consolidated way from the industry side. It's still under discussion and we will face a uh, next serious round of discussion with regard to the upcoming executive board meeting still in January this year. Uh, thank you. I, 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 I hear the telegraphed message. Thank you. Um, <laughs> in, in terms of a uh, uh, follow-up question, uh, two questions to, to anybody in the audience, in, in fact. Um, one is we've heard a lot in the last two days about the, the hope of the new technologies um, and um, in terms of, of meeting, attempting their opp opportunities perhaps to get around and beyond some of the inherent limitations of egg-based uh, technologies um, as well as some of the inherent um, uh, challenges of the influenza virus itself. Um, and uh, m being that there are many optimists in the audience, um, uh, if I could ask the, the uh, panelists if, if uh, the academic sector and, and uh, the, the uh, private sector um, in general uh, shares that optimism. Um, uh, in, and if, if uh, they, they share the optimism, then uh, what are some of the enablers that could accelerate um, that uh, uh, movement uh, towards uh, the new technologies? <laughs> two, two easy answers. Of course we're optimistic. And what would be an enabler? Money. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, of course, the academic environment is where a lot of the uh, uh, novel technologies, ideas, you know, research uh, are attempted to be uh, discovered or answered. So, you know, I, I believe, you know, through certainly the NIH and, you know, government funding sources, private funding, you know, that really is what enables the universities to advance uh, new discoveries. And then it's to all of you to then... Um, uh, confirm that those are good discoveries and then advance them to the next stage. So I think now the academics, in fact, are trying to attempt to go further than just discovery and actually try to uh, confirm that some of the technology can be translatable. So, uh, you know, we are certainly very optimistic. Dr. Hammer, from your perspective. Uh, I think uh, from the private sector side, we have a uh, more balanced view. Because there's no doubt <laughs> that uh, we are talking about uh, very promising development projects. But uh, a first conclusion is uh, we shouldn't ignore the timelines behind in order to get licensed products. <laughs> A second point is sometimes uh, there are unrealistic expectations which are uh, still firmly established in different audiences and I can refer in particular to the expectations about the advantages of cell culture technologies. 
And what I'm talking about means in particular uh, these theoretical uh, opportunities to upscale immediately in case of a pandemic threat, for example, existing manufacturing capacities, and I'm afraid that's a bit far from reality. Because once a company has to decide to invest in a technology, it doesn't make so much difference if it is an egg-based technology or cell culture technology. In case of an egg technology, you will invest uh, preferably in incubation, egg incubation capacities and the complementary uh, equipment in case of cell culture technology, you will establish a certain fermentation capacity. Once you have done it, it's a given and you cannot increase these fermentation capacities in the short term. The second uh, aspect is quite often uh, the comment uh, uh, will be made, uh, okay, at least uh, Big Pharma should have additional capacities which uh, could be used in a specific situation in favor of producing flu vaccines, which are usually dedicated to producing other vaccines. Even if this would be uh, feasible with regard to the upstream activities, we will face easily serious hurdles in terms of downstream needs. Because in order to purify, to concentrate, to isolate the uh, biologically active ingredients, we are talking about very antigen-specific technologies. So, and once you have, for example, established a facility which is used for the production of hepatitis A vaccine, you cannot use the same downstream technologies uh, for purifying influenza viruses uh, and antigens. And a final aspect, uh, as uh, recently highlighted uh, during the per uh, Terrapin Congress uh, end of November, uh, also being held here in Washington, if we take into perspective the very recent experience in terms of timely availability of vaccines during that H1N1 uh, event, uh, it's not really supporting all these claims about an earlier availability of cell culture-derived vaccines because it looked exactly the opposite way. Uh, uh, Doug Holtzman, Bill and the Gates Foundation. So I, I'm not at all um, uh, averse to putting people in uncomfortable positions in terms of questions. And I'll, I'm going to put everybody in the audience a little bit here. So we, we helped with WHO and Oliver Wyman to develop a, a, a report around the H5 stockpile that's publicly available. And, and if we reflect on what we're trying to accomplish here and some of the comments, including from, from PAHO, you know, I think, of course, everybody would like to have their own manufacturing capacity and full control of their destiny. But I, I do think, despite the fact that I'm an optimist, we have to separate science from science fiction. And I think what I'd ask uh, uh, anybody who would like to comment on, in that report about the deployment of the stockpile, you could look at two opposite poles. You could look at a single site that held all the H5 vaccine and then tried to distribute it out to every single country. Or you could have individual country stockpiles, and again, just just like with the manufacturing issues, there are logistics issues that come with this kind of a distributed approach. So to me, the key question that needs to get grappled with is how, how do we integrate the sort of the economics and the politics and the, the technology and logistics issues and, and what data is missing right now to, to take a look at that whole picture? Because in the end, preparing for a pandemic is a little bit like an insurance policy, right? I mean, it is not, you know, I don't think it's realistic to think that we're going to be using six billion doses of seasonal flu on an annual basis anytime you know in, in my lifetime right now and that's not the way it's looking so you know there's a technology component but but how much are governments willing to pay how much are institutions willing to pay for that insurance policy and and what's the right balance between the sustainability and and, and that broader need and I don't know how to sort of bring that analytics together but um, I, I think it, it's going to take a lot of work from from where we are today and uh, and I think that that we, we, we need to consider Consider that question. I entirely agree. It's uh, fully highlighting uh, the reflections uh, uh, we had over time in uh, with regard to these kind of activities, and I uh, would like. Uh, 
to underline in particular your point you made about science and science fiction. And uh, what I strongly believe is uh, we, it might be premature for the time being, but uh, quite soon we will be in a position really to take some lessons learned from concrete activities we put in place in fighting against the pandemic threat and that keeps included the very important stockpiling approaches from WHO side supported by some of the donor companies. We should uh, really evaluate how the uh, working models we put in place, how to deploy uh, these stocks worked in reality uh, because from my personal point of view I'm very much in or more in favor of thinking about a regional approach instead of a, a nation-based approach and that refers in particular to the scope of complexities from a logistical perspective. And uh, your point you made at the end is also a very important one uh, because that's really uh, representing science fiction if you would uh, finally believe in the reliability of uh, plants producing on a regular base uh, to uh, run seasonal flu vaccination programs, uh, six million, uh, billion uh, vaccine doses year by year because it would ignore fully the reality we have in place. Because we are still facing a lack of understanding of the epidemiology in many parts of the world, that's uh, especially the situation uh, in Africa, that's the situation in major parts of Southeast Asia, it's still the situation in some parts uh, of Northern Asia. In so far as discussed yesterday, a lot needs to be done to improve the global surveillance in order to understand the medical needs. So, and the second point is uh, we have also to take into perspective some experience from the more reliable situation we have already in the developed countries because it's a matter of fact that many of these industrial countries are still far away from the WHO targets in terms of vaccination coverage. Dr. Patazzi, any closing comments from you? Please? Thank you. I think this has been certainly for me very interesting considering I'm not in the field of uh, flu vaccine development. but. When certainly I was asked to come and represent Peter and, uh, and provide some potential roles of uh, new stakeholders uh, and even uh, what would be incentives, I think that you know what we what I can provide or what I've heard also is um, provide the, the the models or the examples or the lessons learned that other others that are, um, that play a game into developing control tools for specific uh, different diseases. You know, the model of uh, uh, partnerships and product development uh, partnerships, uh, like uh, Dr. Jarav was mentioning about the different um, lessons learned with different technologies transferred, working with different partners in whether it's an IDC country or whether it's a developing country or a developed country. I think those are all thoughts that you all can take and, and, and learn from and, and, and attempt to see what would apply and what wouldn't apply to developing certainly uh, vaccines for flu and all their inherent uh, issues with regards to uh, the fact that it's probably much more complicated than, than other vaccines. Uh, as far as the incentives, I think that more than anything, it's always going to be driven um, certainly by the global health needs and by the fact that you know we're all here to try to um, ensure that we have better health in the world and you know and develop by developing uh, products that would then uh, attempt to especially uh, um, alleviate the needs in, in populations that are more more. Uh, unfortunate than we are. Um, so the incentives, I think, that should be driven mostly from there, but then, of course, you have to have all the other resources, funding, um, uh, technology, capacity available for, for um, being able to um, uh, use those technologies. Thank you. Dr. Norwood. Uh, two to three very short points from my side as far as the 
discussion is concerned, we are just going to, uh, to complete. I think it's highlighting that with regard to a lot of uh, different aspects and elements, there is widely consensus. Second, uh, I was very pleased with the outcome of that workshop, uh, taking into perspective in particular the experience over the last two days, because we gained a much better understanding of the complexity behind these plans uh, and ideas, and I'm referring back again to the very constructive and important discussion we had yesterday about the regulatory dimension behind and my final point, uh, referring back uh, to the question which was raised uh, by Dr. Miller and also saying it's may most probably not the objective for that meeting about the affordability of vaccines uh, in uh, the least developed countries. It's for sure not a flu-specific issue. It would apply the same way for other types of uh, vaccines and uh, drugs. And I think we uh, can all agree that we need uh, to explore creative models in, over to, uh, in order to overcome uh, these kind of hurdles we have still in place. Thank you. Well, I'd like to thank uh, both my speakers for an excellent and stimulating um, talks that they've given and to stimulating your thoughts. And I appreciate your, your contributions. Thanks very much, everyone.